Chapter 7 of Gladiator. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gladiator by Philip Wiley. Chapter 7. From the day of his arrival, Webster University felt the presence of Hugo Danner. Classes, football practice, hazing, fraternity scouting began on that morning with a feverish and good-natured hurly-burly that for a time completely bewildered him. Hugo participated in everything. He went to the classroom with pleasure. It was never difficult for him to learn, and never easier than in those first few weeks. The professors he had known, and he reluctantly included his own father, were dry-as-dust individuals who had none of the humanities. And at least some of the professors at Webster were brilliant, urbane, capable of all understanding. Their lectures were like tonic to Hugo. The number of his friends grew with amazing rapidity. It seemed that he could not cross the campus without being hailed by a member of the football team and presented to another student. The Psi Delta saw to it that he met the entire personnel of their chapter at Webster. Other fraternities looked at him with covetous eyes, but Lefty Forsman, who was chairman of the membership committee, let it be known that the Psi Deltas had marked Hugo for their own, and no one refused their bid. On the second Monday after college opened, Hugo went to the class elections, and found to his astonishment that he had received twenty-eight votes for president. A boy from a large preparatory school was elected, but twenty-eight votes spoke well for the reputation he had gained in that short time. On that day, too, he learned the class customs. Freshmen had to wear black caps, black shoes, and socks and ties. They were not allowed to walk on the grass or to ride bicycles. The ancient cannon in the center of the class square was defended annually by the sophomores and its theft was always attempted by the freshmen. No entering class had stolen it in eight years. Those things amused Hugo. They gave him an intimate feeling of belonging to his school. He wrote to his parents about them. Dean Aiken, the newly elected president of the freshman class, approached Hugo on the matter of the cannon. We want a gang of good husky boys to pull it up some night and take it away. Are you with us? Sure. Left to his own considerations, Hugo recalled his promise and walked across the campus with the object of studying the cannon. It was a medium-sized piece of Revolutionary War vintage. It stood directly in the rear of Webster Hall, and while Hugo regarded it, he noted that two sophomores remained in the vicinity. He knew that guard, changed every two hours, would be on duty day and night until Christmas was safely passed. Well, the cannon was secure. It couldn't be rolled away. The theft of it would require first a free-for-all with the sophomores, and after a definite victory, a mob assault of the gun. Hugo walked closer to it. Off the grass, freshman. He wheeled obediently. One of the guards approached him. Get off the grass and stay off, and don't look at that cannon with longing. It isn't healthy for young freshmen. Hugo grinned. All right, feller, but you better keep a double guard on that thing while I want it. Two nights later, during a heavy rain that had begun after the fall of dark, Hugo clad himself in a slicker and moved vaguely into the night. Presently he reached the cannon yard, and in the shelter of an arch he saw the sophomore guards. They smoked cigarettes, and one of them sang softly. Day and night a pair of conscripted sentries kept watchful eyes on the gun. A shout from either of them would bring the whole class tumbling from its slumber in a very few moments. Hugo moved out of their vision. The campus was empty. He rounded Webster Hall, the mud sucking softly under his feet, and the rain dampening his face. From beneath his coat he took a flare and lighted the fuse. He heard the two sophomores running toward it in the thick murk. When they were very close, he stepped on to the stone flagging, looked up into the cloudy sky, gathered himself, and leaped over the three stories of Webster Hall. He landed with a loud thud ten feet from the cannon. When the sophomores returned, after extinguishing the flare, their cherished symbol of authority had vanished. There was din on the campus, 
First the loud cries of two voices, then the screech of raised windows, the babble of more voices, and the rush of feet that came with new gusts of rain. Flashlights pierced the gloom where the cannon had been. A hundred and then two hundred figures gathered, swirled, organized search parties, built a fire. Dawn came, and the cannon was still missing. The clouds lifted. In the wan light someone pointed up. There, on the roof of Webster Hall, with the numerals of the freshman class painted on its muzzle, was the old weapon. Arms stretched. An angry, incredulous hum waxed to a steady pitch and waned as the sophomores dispersed. In the morning, theory ran rife. The freshmen were tight-lipped, pretending knowledge where they had none, exulting secretly. Dean Aiken was kidnapped at noon and given a third degree which extorted no information. The theft of the cannon and its elevation to the roof of the hall entered the annals of Webster legend, and Hugo, watching the laborious task of its removal from the roof, seemed merely as pleased and as mystified as the other freshmen. So the autumn commenced. The first football game was played, and Hugo made a touchdown. He made another in the second game. They took him to New York in November for the dinner that was to celebrate the entrance of a new chapter to Psi Delta. His fraternity had hired a private car. As soon as the college towers vanished, the entertainment committee took over the party. Glasses were filled with whiskey and passed by a Negro porter. Hugo took his with a feeling of nervousness and of excited anticipation. The coach had given him permission to break training advised it in fact and hugo had never tasted liquor he watched the others holding his glass gingerly they swallowed their drinks took more the effect did not seem to be great he smelled the whiskey and the smell revolted him drink up danner never use the stuff i'm afraid it'll throw me not you come on bottoms up it ran into his throat hot and steaming he swallowed a thousand needles and knew the warmth of it in his stomach they gave another glass to him and then a third some of the brothers were playing cards hugo watched them he perceived that his feet were loose on their ankles and that his shoulders lurched it would not do to lose control of himself he thought for another man it might be safe but not for him he repeated the thought inanely someone took his arm nice work in that game last week pretty thanks woody says you're the best man on the team glad you went side dealt best house on the campus great school webster you'll love it sure hugo said the railroad coach was twisting and writhing peculiarly hugo suddenly wanted to be in the air he hastened to the platform of the car and stood on it squinting his eyes at the countryside when they reached the grand central terminal he was cured of his faintness they rode to the theater in an omnibus and saw the matinee of a musical show Hugo had never realized that so many pretty girls could be gathered together in one place. Their scant, glittering costumes flashed in his face. He wanted them. Between the acts, the fraternity repaired in a body to the lavatory and drank whiskey from bottles. Hugo began to feel that he was living at last. He was among men, sophisticated men, and learning to be like them. Nothing like the camaraderie, the show, the liquor in Indian Creek. He was wearing the suit that Lefty Forsman had chosen for him. He felt well-dressed, cool, capable. He was intensely well disposed towards his companions. And when the show was over, he stood in the bright lights, momentarily depressed by the disappearance of the long file of girls. Then he shouldered among his companions and went out of the theater riotously. Two long tables were drawn up at the Raven, a restaurant famous for its roast meats, its beer, and its lack of scruples about the behavior of its guests. The Psi Deltas took their places at the tables. The dining room they occupied was private. Hugo saw it as if in a dream. The long rows of silverware, the dishes of celery and olives, and the ranks of shining glasses. They sat. Waiters wound their way among them. There was a song. The Toastmaster, a New York executive who had graduated from Webster twenty years before, understood the temper of his charge. He was witty, ribald, genial. He made a speech, but not too long a speech. He called on the president of a bank, who rose totteringly and undid the Toastmaster's good offices by making too long a speech. 
it reiterated dear old Webster's were finally lost in the ring and tinkle of glassware and cutlery at the end of the long meal Hugo realized that his being had undergone change Objects approached and receded before his vision the voice of the man sitting beside him came to his ears as though through water his mind continually turned upon itself in a sort of infatuated examination his attention could not be held even on his own words he decided that he was feverish then someone said well Danner how do you like being drunk drunk sure you aren't going to tell me you're sober are you when the speaker had gone Hugo realized that it was Chuck there had been no feeling of recognition I'm drunk he said someone give Danner a drink he has illusions drunk why this man isn't drunk it's monstrous he has a weakened spine that's all I'm drunk Hugo repeated he knew then what it was to be drunk the toastmaster was rising again Hugo saw it dimly fellas a fork banged on a glass fellas there was a slow increase in silence fellas it's eleven o'clock now and I have a surprise for you surprise hey guys shut up for the surprise fellas what I was going to say is this the girls from the show we saw this afternoon are coming over here all 30 of them We're going up to my house for a real party and the little be off anything goes only Anybody that fights gets thrown out straight off without an argument. Are you on? The announcement was greeted by a stunned quiet which grew into a bellow of approval Plates and glasses were thrown on the floor Lefty leaped on to the table and performed a dance the proprietor came in looked and left hastily and then the girls arrived They came through the door after a moment of reluctant hesitation like a flood of brightly colored water They sat down in the laps of the boys on chairs on the edge of the disarrayed tables They were served with innumerable drinks as rapidly as the liquor could be brought They were working that night for the ten dollars promised to each one But they were working with college boys which was a rest from the stream of affluent and paunchy males who made their usual escort Their gaiety was better than assumed Hugo had never seen such a party or dreamed of one his vision was cleared instantly of its cobwebs he saw three boys seize one girl and turn her heels over head a piano was moved in she jumped up and started dancing on the table then there was a voice at his side hello good-looking I could use that drink if you can spare it Hugo looked at the girl she had brown hair that had been curled her lips and cheeks were heavily rouged and the corners of her mouth turned down in a sort of petulance or fatigue but she was pretty and her body showing whitely above her evening dress was creamy and warm he gave the drink to her she sat in his lap gosh he whispered she laughed I saw her first someone said pulling at the girl's arm go away Hugo shouted he pushed the other from them what's your name Bessie what's yours Hugo the girl accepted two glasses from a waiter they drained them looking at each other over the rims got any money Hugo Hugo had he carried on his person the total of his cash assets some fifty dollars sure I have fifty dollars he answered he felt her red lips against his ear let's you and me duck this party and have a little one of our own I've got an apartment not far from here he could hear the pounding of his heart let's they moved unostentatiously from the room outside in the hall she took his hand they ran to the front door there was the echo of bedlam in his whirling mind when they walked through the almost deserted street she called to a taxi and they were driven for several blocks at a cheap dance hall they took a table and drank more liquor when his head was turned she narrowed her eyes and calculated the effect of the alcohol against the dwindling of his purse they danced gee you're a swell dancer so are you Bessie still want to go home with Bessie mm. let's go another taxi ride the light seethed past them a dark house and three flights of rickety stairs the gritty sound of a key in a lock a little room with a table a bed two chairs a gaslight turned low a disheveled profusion of female garments here we are sit down Hugo looked at her tensely he laughed then with a harsh sound 
She flew into his arms, returning his searching caresses with startling frankness. Presently they moved across the room. He could hear the noises on the street at long, hot intervals. Hugo opened his eyes, and the light smote them with pain. He raised his head wonderingly. His stomach crawled with a foul nausea. He saw the dirty room. Bessie was not in it. He staggered to the washbowl and was sick. He noticed then that her clothes were missing. That fact impressed him as one that should have significance. He rubbed his head and eyes. And then he thought accurately. He crossed the room and felt in his trouser pockets. The money was gone. At first it did not seem like a catastrophe. He could telegraph to his father for more money. And then he realized that he was in New York, without a ticket back to the campus, separated from his friends and not knowing the address of the Toastmaster. He could not find his fraternity brothers, and he could not get back to school without more money. Moreover, he was sick. He dressed with miserable slowness and went down to the street. Served him right. He had been a fool. He shrugged. A sharp wind blew out of a bright sky. Maybe, he thought, he should walk back to Webster. It was only eighty miles, and that distance could be negotiated in less than two hours by him. But that was unwise. People would see his progress. He sat down in Madison Square Park and looked at the Flatiron Building with a leisurely eye. A fire engine surged up the street. A man came to collect the trash in a green can. A tramp lay down and was ousted by a policeman. By and by he realized that he was hungry. A little man with darting eyes took a seat beside him. He regarded Hugo at short intervals. At length he said, You got a dime for a cup of coffee? His words were blurred by accent. No, I came here from school last night, and my money was stolen. Ah, there was a tinge of discouragement in the other's voice. And hungry, perhaps? A little. Me, I'm also hungry. I haven't eaten since two days. That impressed Hugo as a shameful and intolerable circumstance. Let's go over there, he indicated a small restaurant, and eat. And then I'll promise to send the money by mail. At least we'll be fed that way. We'll be thrown to the street on our faces. Not I. Nobody throws me on my face. And I'll look out for you. They crossed the thoroughfare and entered the restaurant. The little man ordered a quantity of food, and Hugo, looking guiltily at the waiter, duplicated the order. They became distantly acquainted during the filched repast. The man's name was Izzy. He sold second-hand rugs. But he was out of work. Eventually they finished. The waiter brought the check. He was a large man whose jowls and hips and shoulders were heavily weighted with muscle. Hugo stood up. Listen, fellow, he began placidly. My friend and I have an ascent between us. I'm Hugo Danner from Webster University, and I'll mail you the price of this feed tomorrow. I'll write down my name, and he got no further. The waiter spoke in a thick voice. So, one of them guys, huh? Trying to get away with it when I'm here, huh? Well, I'll tell you how you're going to pay. You're going to pay this check with a bloody mush, see? His fist doubled and drew back. Hugo did not shift his position. The fist came forward, but an arm like stone blocked it. Hugo's free hand barely flicked to the waiter's jaw. He rolled under the table. Come on, he said, but Izzy had already vanished through the door. Hugo walked hurriedly up the street and turned a corner. A hand tugged at his coat. He turned and was confronted by Izzy. I seen you through the window. Jeez, guy, you can box. Say I know where you can clean up if you got the nerve. Clean up? Where? Come on, we better get out of here anyhow. They made their way toward the river. The city changed character on the other side of the elevated railroad, and presently they were walking through a dirty, evil-smelling, congested neighborhood. Where are we going, Izzy? Wait a minute, Mr. Danner. What's the idea? You wait. Another series of dirty blocks, then they came to a bulky building that spread a canopy over the sidewalk. Here, Izzy said, and pointed. His finger indicated a sign, which Hugo read twice. It said, Battling Ole Svensson will meet all comers in this gymnasium at three this afternoon and eight tonight. Fifty dollars will be given to any man, black or white, who can stay three rounds with him and one hundred dollars cash money to the man who knocks out battling Ole Svensson, the terror of the docks. See, Izzy said, rubbing his hands excitedly, 
Maybe you can do it. A light dawned on Hugo. He smiled. I can, he replied. What time is it? Two o'clock. Well, let's go. They entered the lobby of the gymnasium. Mr. Epstein, is he called? I got a fighter for the Swede. Mr. Epstein was a pale, fat man who ignored the handicap of the dank cigar in his mouth and roared when he spoke. He glanced at Hugo and then addressed Izzy. Where is he? There. Epstein looked at Hugo and then was shaken by laughter. There, you says? And there I looks, and what do I see but a pink young angel face that Olay will swallow without chewing? Hugo said, I don't think so. I'm willing to try. Epstein scowled. Run away from here, kid, before you get hurt. Ole would laugh at you. This isn't easy money. It takes a man to get a look at it. Izzy stamped impatiently. I tell you, Mr. Epstein, I seen this boy fight. He's the goods. He can beat your Ole. I bet he can. His voice caught, and he glanced nervously at Hugo. I bet ten dollars he can. How much? Epstein bellowed. Well, say twenty dollars. How much? Fifty dollars. It's all I got, Epstein. All right, go in and sign up and leave your wad, kid. He turned to Hugo. You may think you're a husky, but Ole is a killer. He's six nine in his socks and he weighs two hundred and eighty. He'll mash you. I don't think so, Hugo repeated. Well, you'll be meat. We'll put you on second on the list and the lights'll go out fast enough for you. Hugo followed Izzy and reached him in time to see a fifty-dollar bill peeled from a roll which was extracted with great intricacy from Izzy's clothes. I thought you hadn't eaten for two days. It's God's truth, Izzy answered uneasily. I was saving this dough, and it's lucky too, isn't it? Hugo didn't know whether to laugh or to be angry. He said, and you'd have let me take a poke in the jaw from that waiter. You're a hell of a guy, Izzy. Izzy moved his eyes rapidly. I ain't so bad. I'm betting on you, ain't I? And I got you a chance at the Swede, didn't I? How'd you know that waiter couldn't kill me? Well, he didn't. Anyhow, what's a poke in the jaw to a square meal, huh? When the other fellow gets the poke, and you get the meal? All right, Izzy. I wish I thought Ole was going to lick me. Hugo wrote his name under a printed statement to the effect that the fight managers were not responsible for the results of the combat. The man who led him to a dressing room was filled with sympathy and advice. He told Hugo that one glance at Ole would discourage his reckless Aravis. But Hugo paid no attention. The room was dirty. It smelled of sweat and rubber sneakers. He sat there for half an hour, reading a newspaper. Outside somewhere, he could hear the mumble of a gathering crowd, punctuated by the voices of candy and peanut hawkers. At last they brought some clothes to him. A pair of trunks that flapped over his loins, ill-fitting canvas shoes, a musty bathrobe. When the door of his room opened, the noise of the crowd was louder. Finally it was hushed. He heard the announcer. It was like the voice of a minister coming through the stained windows of a church. It rose and fell, and then the distant note of the gong. After that the crowd called steadily, sometimes in loud rage and sometimes almost in a whisper. Finally, they brought Ole's first victim into Hugo's cell. He was a man with the physique of a bull. His face was cut, and his eyes were darkening. One of the men heaving his stretcher looked at Hugo. Better beat it, kid, while you can still do it on your own feet. You ain't even got the reach for Ole. He's a grizzly bow. He'll just about kill you. Hugo tightened his belt and swung the electric light back and forth with a slow-moving fist. Another man expertly strapped his fists with adhesive tape. When do I go out? Hugo asked. You mean, when do you get knocked out? The second laughed. Fight? Well, if you're determined to get croaked, you do it now. In the arena, it was dazzling. A bank of noisy people rose on all sides of him. Hugo walked down the aisle and clambered into the ring. Ole was one of the largest men he had ever seen in his life. There was no doubt of his six feet nine inches and his two hundred and eighty pounds. Hugo imagined that the man was not a scientific fighter, a bruiser. Well, he knew nothing of fighting either. A man in his shirt sleeve stood up in the ring and bellowed, The next contestant for the reward of fifty dollars to stay three rounds with battling Ole and one hundred dollars to knock him out is Mr. H. Smith. They cheered. It was a nasty sound, filled with a lust for blood. Hugo realized that he was excited. His knees wobbled when he rose, and his hand trembled as he took the monstrous paw of the Swede and saw his unpleasant smile. 
Hugo's heart was pounding. For one instant he felt weak and human before battling Ole. He whispered to himself, Quit it, you fool. You know better. You can't even be hurt. It did not make him any more quiet. Then they were sitting face to face. A bell rang. The hall became silent as the mountainous Swede lumbered from his corner. He towered over Hugo, who stood up and went out to meet him like David approaching Goliath. To the crowd, the spectacle was laughable. There was jeering before they met. Where's your mama? Got your bottle, baby? Put the poor little bastard back in his carriage. What's this, a fight or a freak show? Laughter. It was like cold water to Hugo. His face set. He looked at Ole. The Swede's fist moved back like the piston of a great engine into which steam had been let slowly, and then it came forward. Hugo, trained to see and act in keeping with his gigantic strength, dodged easily. At a boy, one for Johnny, dear. The fist went back and came again and again, as if that piston gathering speed had broken loose and was flailing through the screaming air. Hugo dodged like a beam of light, and the murderous weapon never touched him. The spectators began to applaud his speed. He could beat the Swede's fist every time. Run him, kiddo. It's only three rounds. The bell. Ole was panting. As he sat in his corner, his coal scuttle gloves dangling, he cursed in his native tongue. Too little to hit. The bell rang. The second round was the same. Hugo never attempted to touch the Swede, only to avoid him. And the man worked like a Trojan. Sweat seethed over his big blank face. His small eyes sharpened to points. He brought his whole carcass flinging through the air after his fist. But every blow ended in a sickening wrench that missed the target. The crowd grew more excited. During the interval between the second and third rounds, there was betting on the outcome. Three to one that Ole would connect and murder the boy. Four to one. One to five that Hugo would win fifty dollars before he died beneath the trip hammer. The third round opened. The crowd suddenly tired of the sport. A shrill female voice reached Hugo's cold, concentrated mind. Keep on running, yellow baby. So they wanted a killing. They called him yellow. The Swede was on him. Elephantine, sweating, sucking great rumbling breaths of air, swinging his fists. Hugo studied the motion. That fist to that side, up down now like hail they began to land upon the swede bewilderingly everywhere no hope of guarding every blow smashed stung ached no chance to swing back cover up his arms went over his face he felt rivets drive into his kidneys he reached out and clinched they rocked in each other's arms dazed by that bitter onslaught of lightning blows ole thought only to lock hugo in his arms and crush him when they clinched the crowd, grown instantly hysterical, sank back in despair. It was over. Ole could break the little man's back. They saw his arms spring into knots. Jesus! Hugo's fist shot between their chests, and Ole was thrown violently backward. Impossible! He lunged back, crimson to kill, one hand guarding his jaw. Easy now, for the love of God, easy, Hugo said to himself. There, on the hand at the chin, Hugo's gloves went out, lift him it connected the swede left the floor and crumpled slowly with a series of bumping sounds and how the hyenas yelled they crowded into his dressing room afterwards epstein came to his side before he had dressed come out and have a mug of suds kid that was the sweetest fight i ever hoped to live to see i can sign you up for a fortune right now i can make you champ in two years no thanks hugo said the man persisted he talked earnestly he handed Hugo a hundred-dollar bill. Hugo finished his dressing. Izzy wormed his way in. Fifty dollars I won yet. Didn't I told you, Mr. Epstein? Come here, Izzy. The little man ran to shake Hugo's hand, but it was extended for another reason. I want that fifty you won, he said unsmilingly. When a bird tracks along for a free feed and lets another guy fight for him, and has a roll big enough to stop up a rain spout, he owes money. That lunch will set you back just exactly what you want on me. There was laughter in the room. Izzy whimpered. Ain't you got a hundred already that I got for you? Ain't it enough that you got it? Ain't I got a wife with kids yet? No, it ain't yet. Hugo snapped the fingers of his extended hand. The other hand doubled significantly. Izzy gave him the money. He was almost in tears. The others guffawed. Wait up, Bo. 
Give us your address if you ever change your mind. You can pick up a nice living in this game. No, thanks. All I needed was railroad fare. Thank you, gentlemen, and goodbye. No one undertook to hinder Hugo's departure. End of chapter 7